Our next speaker is Mary Lou Fairweather. Mary Lou has been a plant pathologist with the USDA Forest Service for over 20 years. She currently works for the Arizona Forest Health Protection in Flagstaff, Arizona. Her primary responsibility is providing technical assistance for forest diseases to land managers. Recent focus is on the agents involved in aspen dieback and decline, including impacts on aspen regeneration, dwarf mistletoe, and root disease ecology and management, and training on hazard tree identification and mitigation. Her education includes a BS in biology from Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado, and an MS in plant pathology from the University of Arizona. Okay. Good afternoon. I guess it's working. Um, so uh, um, I wanted to go ahead and uh, talk about the uh, role that uh, browsing has played in the aspen decline in Arizona. Okay, so there's uh, uh, four basic uh, areas that I want to cover. Uh, one is to summarize the aspen decline. Um, I had talked about this back in 2004, shortly after um, Aspen decline had started in our state um, at this conference when it was held in Cedar City. So uh, it'll definitely be an update of that talk. Um, also, I uh, have been looking into some of the history of browsing of Aspen that's actually documented in, uh, in uh, science literature with the Forest Service. <coughs> I also wanted to show you where Aspen is okay in our state, uh, where it's going to make it at least for a while, uh, depending on where the climate change takes it. And uh, I also wanted to touch on some of the collaboration um, efforts that have taken place. Okay, so first I wanted um, just to remind everybody that uh, we're getting into the southern extent of Aspen in Arizona. There is some in Mexico as well. But um, we have very low acreage, especially in the uh, aspen-dominated stands. This number is from before the aspen decline events that I'm about to talk about. So, so we uh, have a lot less than that now. All right, so taking those general outlines of where you find aspen, um, what is showing here in, in the blue, if you can see it, uh, it's very light. Um, that shows more specifically where you're likely to find aspen. Uh, there's not very much blue going on down here on the Coronado National Forest, and that's just because of the, um, the, the um, uh, satellite imagery that they use it does not pick that up. Okay, the next slide that I'm going to lay on top of this, or, or the next um, layer um, of um, the GIS layer is of the aspen decline that we recorded. I should say aspen decline plus defoliation that uh, our aerial surveyors who fly the skies mapped in um, from 1999 through 2008. And so now you can see some red blobs and you also see that the extent of aspen is beyond those areas uh, that were picked up with the remote sensing. Um, a couple other things I wanted to point out here are um, that um, we have differences in aerial surveyors. So uh, within our region, we have two people who do aerial detection survey. One of them is what we call a lumper, and the other one is a splitter. So the lumping shows up pretty well here because you've got a big red blob on the acres impacted. And so we can't really go off of um, just the acres that we report for a year because this is not um, a specific uh, science, it's just an estimate. <coughs> However, um, from being on the ground and looking around um, of what areas were exfoliated versus those that had the dieback within them, <coughs> we estimate that about 80,000 acres of our aspen type were impacted at some level. Okay, so here's what the low elevation sites look like back in, um, uh, this uh, was an aerial photograph in 2004, but uh, this is at about 7,000 feet elevation. There's also some aspen on uh, Woody Mountain here. And you can see that uh, there's been a huge amount of mortality. This is in the middle of summer when this shot was taken. Going back to 2002 when we saw the mortality occurring within this particular area, um, basically it looked like the uh, bark was just popping off. 
And I want you to focus on what's going on on the ground here. You can see that all the vegetation is, um, is pretty much wiped out. Um, back or in 2008, I retook a picture within the same stand. You can t see that it's greened up. What was going on here uh, was that there was um, both deer and elk uh, had their nurseries set up in the stand. I uh, repeatedly entered my plots so that I could record uh, regeneration that was happening as a response of these trees dying. And I did have regeneration initially, um, and therefore I wanted to keep going back in and seeing how they did. But what we saw was that the deer and the deer cleared out pretty quick as far as we didn't see them the second year and the, the uh, following years. But the elk stayed in here for a long time before um, um, no longer continuing to have their nursery in there anyway. Okay, so getting up a little higher in elevation, this is 8,200 feet. Um, so the previous slide, those stands being that low in elevation were on north facing slopes. Getting up to 8,200 feet, now we're no longer on north facing slopes, but we're still in aspen pine type. Um, up in this area, it was uh, uh, more like 60% mortality overall. And uh, here we're going from the Coconino National Forest over to the Apache Sikres National Forest at 9,200 feet. You can see that within this um, uh, advanced conifer succession um, that the aspen has died out um, pretty drastically as well. Um, on the Coconino at this elevation, we only had um, around 16% mortality overall. But on the Apache Sikres, in the affected sites, um, it was pushing 40%. The other thing to notice here though is that we have regeneration. It may be a little on the bushy side um, because it is getting browsed somewhat, but, um, but we have this age group which doesn't exist over on the Coconino National Forest. Okay, and then up on the North Kaibab, um, we also saw a lot of uh, uh, dieback and mortality going on, but it, uh, it seemed like the trees were trying to hang in there longer as far as uh, um, actually being alive, not technically dead, right? Because it still has some um, vegetation left on the trees. And the other thing that we saw there uh, with the regeneration is that the, the bark of these young sprouts are not all sparred up. Okay, so um, let's just go over what a decline disease is uh, as far as a plant pathologist is concerned. Um, we have definite definitions for it. Rapid mortality of a species. Well, we had um, in those lower elevation sites, we were pushing 60% mortality in a four year period. So that would be rapid mortality. Um, there's an oops, interaction of a number of interchangeable factors. And these factors are of three types, predisposing factors, inciting factors, and contributing factors. So just going over them for Arizona, predisposing factors would include physical factors, uh, which would be elevation, aspect, as well as management, um, which the big one here would be fire su suppression, allowing the succession of stands. This is the San Francisco Peaks, just outside of um, Flagstaff, Arizona, and uh, research that has been done by the Ecological Restoration Institute showed that um, above the 9,500 foot level, there hadn't been any recruitment of aspen since about the 1920s. And the other thing that um, FIA plots showed across Arizona was that uh, uh, compared to other states, we had an um, a older tree, average older tree age as well as size, even though we don't have many plots with aspen. Okay, and then um, for years, uh, people had talked about the impact of uh, livestock and wild ungulates on uh, recruitment of aspen, and I'll be going over that in a bit. Now, the inciting factors are the factors that uh, cause the most attention because they're, that's when mortality happens. In our case, we had a frost event, a late frost event in June of 1999. In fact, that was the year that we recorded the most acres of damage in our aspen type based on the aerial detection surveys. Now, uh, leaves, when they're expanding on aspen, but they haven't quite matured, are very susceptible to frost damage. What we saw from this event was not only a loss of leaves, but also dieback of stems, 
where the public was actually calling up and asking what had happened. Um, and then we also had a long-term drought going on, which began in 1996, and warmer temperatures, uh, uh, a very severe drought with warmer temperatures in 2002 is what really kicked off a lot of the dieback. And then we had insect defoliation that contributed to it. Um, uh, Western temp caterpillar, although it had been reported in outbreaks in the 1970s in Arizona, um, during my career there up until this event, um, we had not seen Western temp caterpillar activity, but we had it um, three out of four years uh, right after the drought. So that contributed to mortality at the mid and higher elevation. Okay, and then um, for contributing factors, well, we had um, uh, what I'm most known uh, for is working on pathogens. We had the Cytospora canker. It uh, is not aggressive, but it is um, very assertive when trees are weakened uh, by stress. So we have um, that helping to kill trees off, as well as the bark beetles that were mentioned uh, yesterday and a wood borer. <coughs> and again, in contributing factors, we have the browsers. Okay, so look, let's look back at this uh, mortality map. Um, one thing that I wanted uh, to point out here, so I set up some plots here and here as a response to the, um, the dieback going on. And what I was able to record, this is just on average, this, there was about uh, 80 plots on the Coconino and 60 plots on the Apache Sipgraves is that on average, um, even considering all the elevations at which the plots were at, we had some response as far as aspen sprouts on these plots. Now on the Coconino, it started out at 918, then it went up a little bit, and the reason why that would have gone up is because we still had continuing mortality going on. Um, and so, uh, so with that increased mortality, we had increased sprouting, but then uh, the, the number of sprouts declined. So that was 2006 that I was measuring all of these plots. Um, I continued to measure them on the Coconino National Forest, and by 2009, we averaged only 110 rabbits per acre. Only 45% of the plots even had rabbits anymore, and that's because of those lower elevations. We just had uh, so much dieback, there was nothing left to sprout. Um, in that particular year, 65% of the suckers were browsed, but of course it depends on where you're there if you're picking up the browsing or not. Um, in Arizona, because we have those fluctuations in elevation, the um, elk tend not to stick around in the wintertime because they don't have to. They can go down to the pinion juniper in lower elevations, which they do. Um, after uh, seven years of measuring these, 97% of the rabbits that were left are still under a foot. So there is no recruitment going on. Whatever is sprouting uh, can't get past a foot, um, except for 3% that were less than three feet. Okay, so now um, switching over to pre the predisposing side of uh, elk um, is that uh, since the 1880s, 1980s, sorry, 1980s, the uh, forests in Arizona, several of them, have been putting up these very tall fences to keep elk out. We've seen a lot of pictures of this this week. <coughs> when they uh, put up the first ones in the mid-1980s, they thought that they could take it down after five years and the uh, sprouts would be big enough to escape uh, the elk impacts. <coughs> but, um, they removed the fence and, and uh, the best tasting clothes were snapped off um, so that they were just, uh, the cows can't get up on their hind legs right, but the elk can. <coughs> so that was uh, uh, wiped out in many places. The one thing um, uh, that we saw during the, the drought, this fence had just been put up before the big drought hit without removal of the older trees. And although there was dieback in here, um, the, the sprouting of the roots had allowed this clone to survive. 
And that was the case for all of the fenced areas, is that we did not see the drought impacts within those areas. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit more about the elk. In Arizona, we didn't have Rocky Mountain elk originally. We had the Miriam's elk. <coughs> Um, there's not a whole lot of difference in the size of these two animals. Um, there are some structural differences in the nasal cavity and the jaw, um, but basically they're about the same size. Uh, based on uh, 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 research of looking at where the early explorers who came through saw the elk occur, um, it is believed that the Miriam's elk were over here at the border of New Mexico and Arizona, so it would have been in eastern Arizona, as well as southern New Mexico. And But the elk up in northern New Mexico would have been Rocky Mountain elk. Um, the, what Truett is showing here is, in, as of 1996, the distribution of the Rocky Mountain elk after it was introduced. So it was introduced into Arizona from Yellowstone in uh, 1913, as well as in the 1950s uh, near um, Arizona, near Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, an interesting uh, thing that quotation that I found from Aldo Leopold was that it should be borne in mind that while the perpetuation of the elk as a species is imperative, its reintroduction into every forest is by no means advisable, and that was back in 1918. Okay, so um, again, where we uh, had elk originally was here, now uh, we have it here, here, um, here, here. Um, but the more important uh, point, I think, is not so much that the elk has spread all over, but where the bulk of the population is managed. Rather than it being managed at a higher uh, population here, it's now managed for a higher population over in the center of the state, and, and that shows um, from the impacts that we see. <coughs> so uh, this is the Coconino National Forest. Based, the blue is the aspen type, and the red is the aspen type that's been impacted. And uh, for some of the historical photos I'm about to show, it's the, it occurs right in here. Okay, so livestock grazing, of course, was introduced long before the elk were. And um, here's a um, photo from up high where you can see um, the grazing impacts from a long time ago um, mixed in with uh, uh, what's going on currently. And currently this area is not uh, grazed at all. There is no permittee on the San Francisco peaks. There's no grazing going on. So we still are seeing the impacts of the grazing combined with those of the elk browsing. So Gus Pearson, which I'm sure uh, many of you have heard of, he's a researcher from the turn of the last century. He actually wrote a paper on the role of aspen in reforestation of mountain burns in Arizona and New Mexico. And this is from 1914. And basically there are some photos from up on the peaks that shows the impact from the sheep. Um, this happens to be an area where they cleared out aspen and uh, and planted some Douglas fir. They also planted Douglas fir within the aspen itself because they were interested in looking at um, how aspen helps uh, the conifer species grow. Uh, here's an area where they ended up fencing the sheep out and they got a bunch of aspen sprouts growing. And um, uh, here's where they planted some Douglas fir seed to grow up in the aspen. But what this actually shows very well is uh, something you can't see today. Not only can you not see the size just growing freely up there, but um, also it's not impacted in any way um, on the bark. All right. Um, for years I have been uh, looking at the San Francisco peaks and wondering why. Um, you could see some fence lines in here. Um, and what I found out from looking through some of the old research was that in that particular area they had actually done an excelsior harvest back in 1942. The interesting thing about it, both silviculturally and also um, um, from an Aspen Health standpoint is that they harvested all trees above eight inches and uh, the stand that was left 
was those that, have, that were already there. Residual trees in the two inch to um, just below eight inch category. And this is what the stand looks like today, as well as uh, what I just showed in the picture previously. Um, there, they had plots in here that they monitored and they had no recruitment whatsoever. So I, I'm not quite sure what the uh, fence was about, if it was on the other side or not. But it wasn't obviously fencing out any sheep since they had no other recruitment. Okay, then a similar uh, uh, study was done just about a mile over on the same mountain in 1949. Um, by the way, they were using this Excelsior uh, harvest uh, to supply uh, Phoenix with um, cooling pads. That's what they use the Excelsior for, for their, um, um, not the, the refrigeration, the uh, swamp coolers, yeah. Okay, and what they actually did in here is they did set up a fence, and what happened was they had three different uh, treatment blocks that they were following. And uh, they, um, after they harvested those big trees, they had um, poisoned some areas, they harvested them all, and they also looked at different times of year. I think someone asked that, a question about that at the end of the day yesterday. But uh, here they looked at um, harvesting at different times of the year, but the experiment was kind of a bust because of the sheep browse that uh, limited the regeneration except for the one block where they put this fence in. And uh, you can still see signs of that fence today. Again, there's no sprouting going on um, outside of that fence, even though we no longer have sheep or cattle up there. This is only being browsed by elk and deer, of course. Um, and there's just what the same area looks like when it was growing uh, with that fence protection. Okay, and then um, Michael and as well as uh, James Peaks had mentioned the, um, the North Kaibab and the um, deer um, explosion that happened uh, last century. And uh, that's the only record we have of a fence being put up to support aspen um, growing uh, due to a, a native ungulate population. And that I'll be showing a few more pictures of that in a second, that area, although after things turned around. And this is from uh, deer browsing up on the San Francisco peaks on the Coconino again. So uh, now we're moving on to where is Aspen getting the upper hand. And uh, you may have been shocked by that picture already. Um, and this is a totally different twist um, and not likely to happen very often. But uh, since we saw it in the forest, I had to show it to you. But this elk had the misfortune of getting its uh, um, antlers stuck between uh, two fork trees and something bad happened. So that was just my wake up picture. So, um, so the picture I just showed you where the fence was protecting the aspen up on the North Kaiba with that whole deer explosion. Well, today things are quite different. Um, we had a fire there. Um, this was actually on the north rim of the Grand Canyon, which is right next to the North Kaiba. And um, the fire happened in 2000, and the, the trees are at a really good height. There's a lot of stuff going on in the undergrowth. Here's another fire that happened more recently up there. Again, we're seeing really good uh, sprouting occurring and survival uh, following fire, at least so far. Um, getting down to where the, the um, elk are, are at a higher population, um, things aren't so good. The Sochtefer fire occurred in 1996. You see the, the browse impacts going on. Well, what really happened was this area in the flat was fenced. Uh, about 300 acres were fenced, and that allowed disease trees to even exist. Otherwise, it would be like the rest of the area in the foreground where they don't. What we do see is that um, uh, on steeper slopes, we get more survival after fire of the sprouting occurring just because uh, it appears that the animals spend less time there. 
I don't know if you've heard about the Schultz fire. This one just happened this year outside of Flagstaff. They saved the homes from the fire, but unfortunately the, the um, uh, runoff isn't, wasn't so nice to the homeowners below. But we went up there just a couple weeks ago to look and see how the Aspen were doing um, on some of the plots that I had established in there to monitor the, the dieback. And what we saw was that in many areas, the aspen are the only thing green up there. And um, um, we had a um, Carl Lutch, who's in the, the back here, um, is with Arizona Game and Fish and identified the damages being by elk and not deer. So it's, it's um, the damage was pretty good. You can see the sprouting here. What we also did notice, though, is that there, if there was some steeper topography and maybe a couple logs in the way, that those were being spared from the browsing. Okay, um, the other areas where um, Aspen are doing better is in high recreation sites. So back in 2003, this overstory, it isn't that it just defoliated early, but these, this overstory is actually dead. And um, this uh, smaller tree component is not very um, common on the forest, but yet in high recreation sites we do see some of some recruitment going on. And so you can see that that's what's surviving in there today. Um, also, snow bowl, you notice uh, at a ski area, um, because this is also open in the summertime, that we have recruitment of a size that we don't normally see. Um, waterless areas, I just had to stick this in there. Um, uh, we've noticed, of course, that um, if you, where you don't have water, you don't see as much elk activity. Okay, um, Michael mentioned the Mexican Wolf Reintroduction Program. It has not been going so well. Um, this wolf, I think it's a, a, a different species, um, but at least a subspecies. It, it's being treated like a separate species. Um, the thing about the Mexican wolf reintroduction program is they were only captive bred. There was no place to go to get wild wolves. So, so this has not been as, as successful as the Yellowstone um, reintroduction. And uh, that's focused just right at the border. Um, and they're very much controlled. If there's a, a take of a cow, then um, they may just remove the, go in and remove that wolf from the program. Okay, and uh, as other people have indicated, aspen is not the only species that's being limited. Um, within these fences, we see a lot of uh, paintbrush that we don't see outside of the fences. We'll, we see a lot of ceanothus and other species as well. And um, this, um, of all places, is a, is a model uh, system for me just because there's a lot of different age groups. Uh, how many people have been to Navajo National Monument? Anybody? It's uh, very small. And what this is, it's just a single canyon where they could actually fence out the um, ungulates at either end, including cows. So this has no browsers whatsoever in, in the system. Um, one more thing I just wanted to say real quick was that um, in a ponderosa pine plantation following a fire, we actually got aspen seedlings um, and we had these tested through um, Dr. Karen Mock and, and um, so even though we've been in a drought and uh, climate change is, um, we're being told that our aspen are going to die anyway, we actually have recruitment of uh, uh, drought tolerant types. A few recent papers have called these populations of elk invasive species, or introduced species, or other pejorative terms. And uh, we have quote unquote habitat improvement in the form of water tanks to, to nurture these invasive species in, in the western part of the Mogollon Range and that like stuff. Why do we, why, I don't know any other invasive species that we do that for. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so the question, can you, can you still hear me? So the question is, um, why do we treat um, the Rocky Mountain elk as if it was a native species? Is that a good way to rephrase it? 
because we don't treat any other introduced species to, to, to uh, and so I don't have an answer for it. I don't know why we treat the Rocky Mountain elk that way. Um, other than the fact, and Carl, you can jump in here, um, other than I, I think everybody's aware of how strong the hunter groups are um, as, um, as far as directing things. Um, I'm flailing here, Carl, I don't know if you want to jump in or not. But I don't have an answer. My, my gut feeling or gut answer is if we have an, an introduced elk, why not introduce the uh, northern wolf um, to, to, to uh, counteract it? But that, that's, that's my gut feeling. Any more questions for you? Thank you very much.